Welcome folks to another edition of our Cody Connects webinar series. Today is an introduction to social network analysis. And our guest speaker today is Eric Smith. Eric leads Cody's monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And he's a self-professed data nerd. And he, in, he definitely enjoys exploring how participatory, qualitative, and quantitative monitoring and evaluation methods can transform power and agency to empower people and organizations and partners. Eric has been with us at the Cody since uh, 2016, but prior to his work at the Cody, he was with uh, Genuine Progress, Index Atlantic, and Canada's International Development Research Centre. Today, Eric is going to explore uh, social network analysis and also explore how relationships between people and groups can be visualized and measured. He's going to explore how, who are the influencers, the connectors and the brokers, and how can knowledge and innovation spread. So. Just as a review, social network analysis, and I know Eric will talk more about this, but social network analysis is a method that models and measures relationships between people and groups, and it can help answer these questions. So this webinar will provide an introduction to that social network analysis, including how to collect data and interpret a basic social network map based on a recent study of Cody South African alumni, and I'm happy to see that uh, some have joined us along the way. So without further ado, I'm going to turn off my webcam and I am going to go back to the screen and turn it over to Eric. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Let's try this one. Sorry about that, Eric. Go ahead. No worries. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to ask, uh, is that Jackie from the Global Change Leaders Program? Oh, well, No, maybe. sorry. No, no, no. Oh. Um, Jackie, I'm from Kenya. I just saw the uh, announcement and I just got interested. So I'm a PhD student um, and I'm planning to use social network analysis in my research. So I'm just here to learn. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks for that, Wendy, uh, that introduction, Wendy. Um, <clears throat> over the course of the webinar, we'll talk a little bit, a little bit about um, social network analysis and my small innovations project to use it. I'm not an expert in this uh, by any means, but simply an interested monitoring, evaluation, and learning nerd who thinks it might be a useful tool. So I decided to test it out with our graduate network in South Africa to better understand how it works and what it might do. General flow of the, the webinar will be Social Network Analysis 101 with a few examples of how it can be used, uh, then into my project and very initial findings, followed by a more open discussion. So what is Social Network Analysis? Maybe it's better to start by saying what it isn't. It's not a social network like Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, although social network analysis can be used on those. Instead, wherever there are people, there are social networks, in an organization, in a family, in a neighborhood, in a field of work. For example, grandmothers are often one of the key knowledge and information brokers in a family social network. They know everything, people tell them everything, and they know who to share that information with to influence decision-making and relationships, for good or maybe for evil. It might be similar in our organizations, professional and personal networks. There are some people who are well connected and are takers and sharers of information. Sometimes in an organization, it doesn't match the organizational chart at all. But social network analysis lets us get, lets us get to that information systematically and rigorously to go beyond hunches and intuitions. It lets us map that flow of knowledge, strength of relationships and even social capital within a network. And it doesn't necessarily have to be done on a computer. It can be done like asset mapping or other participatory tools, but software can help visualize uh, and make those connections clear. So what is it? It's really about relationships between people or things and how they interact in a social system. 
Analyzing and visualizing these networks can reveal critical insights for understanding relationships between organizations, supply chains, social movements, or between individuals. It's a versatile tool which can be used throughout the program cycle to measure things like trust in social capital, information flows, resources, collaboration, and disease spread, among other things. So on screen on the right hand side, there is a social network analysis of the 2014-2015 Mandela Washington Fellowship Regional Advisory Board members. The circles represent the members and the lines indicate who they say they are most frequently in contact with. The size of the circles corresponds to the number of interactions they reported over the, uh, over the time period. So why is social network analysis important for ABCD or community development in general? Um, well, it's no surprise to the asset-based community development crowd, but social change needs relationships and networks at the individual, household, community, and policy levels to influence change. Sharing of information and creating positive relationships is central to the ABCD approach. They allow us to access our shared assets. The ABCD crowd is familiar with asset mapping which often includes relationship mapping. Social network analysis shifts the focus to just relationship mapping and provides a different set of tools to analyze and visualize it. So by examining social networks, there's potential for funders, civil society organizations, and others to increase their impact, disseminate new ideas, and influence social change. It's no magic bullet, but it can provide interesting information and a different way of analyzing relationships. Overall, I think it tells us that central to our work is spreading individual action outwards, building networks, and keeping multiple leadership nodes connected. It can also tell us where our, where our networks are weak, what is lost if one person leaves the network, what connections to others are then lost, or where those networks can be strengthened and leveraged. And it has a particular language. So this is the most boring slide. Apologies. But the language used is important for formal social network analysis. It's a little depersonalizing, but is also intended for wide use. Computer networks, films, disease spread, spread of ideas, as well as uh, personal relationships. So when we talk about social network analysis, nodes are actors, are the people, organizations, or other things being analyzed. In a visualization, they're represented by a circle or a dot. Ties or links are the relationships present and they're represented by a line. And direction is about how information flows or not. Directed graphs show how the information flows with arrows. Undirected graphs are used when the flow does not matter. Centrality. There are a few different measures here, but just to keep it brief, how often a, lot, a node lies on the shortest path between two other nodes. The more a node appears on one of those shorter path, paths, the higher its centrality. And then density, how connected the network is, calculated by dividing the number of edges or relationships by the number of all possible edges, resulting in a number between zero and one. So a few examples. Here is a um, social network map based on the New Testament's description of relationships. The central and largest node is Jesus. The two nodes that are circled are Peter and Paul. Paul is the one that's in the upper right and is circled in red. Paul is considered to be the most important person after Jesus in the history of Christianity. He is also credited with writing the largest number of books in the New Testament. But his node is actually smaller than Peter's and about the same size as John the Baptist. I was a little bit surprised by Peter's circle being bigger and more central than Paul's. But this speaks to Peter's role in early church leadership and the network map makes this role a little bit clearer. Our second example is a pretty nerdy one. I'm always happy when I can use Star Trek or Star Wars reference. And this is a map of the relationships in Star Wars A New Hope. The size of the nodes represents time on the screen, and the weight or thickness of each line represents how many times they appear in a scene together. It is an undirected map because it is not about who talks to who, but just who is together in the same scene. <clears throat> and you can see that Luke has the most, most screen time and is probably the most connected character. He shares screen time with many other characters. Darth Vader, despite, his, despite being the most important bad guy, shares no screen time with Luke. 
Interesting, right? So you have to be careful. Just because someone might not be well connected doesn't mean they aren't important to each other or there aren't other factors. So it's one tool among many for analysis and needs to be put into context. And our final example, one that's a little bit more relevant to our field, and, uh, and it also shows an example using sticky notes. The IRC asked the question, who can influence the effectiveness and sustainability of community health workers in Tonko Lily District over the next 12 months? The team then listed, categorized, and positioned all the actors. Yellow notes are healthcare workers, orange notes are the community members, green notes are authorities, blue notes are NGOs, and red notes are funders. They then mapped the types of relationships by arrow color, identified the level of influence from weak, moderate, to strong, and analyzed the network. And this will probably be quite familiar to those of you who have done asset mapping. Essentially, social network analysis is the same, but with relationships and some fancy language and computer software to help out. Not that you have to use computer software, but it can help to test your ideas and draw out some different ideas. So what was I doing with social network analysis? Well, I wanted to test out a tool that might let us shift to network effects and maybe get an idea of what scale or depth of impact looks like. I thought it might be useful to visualize our graduate network and also figure out why people remain connected. South Africa was chosen because we already knew that there was a fairly active asset-based community development network, thanks to Gord and Brienne's ABCD work and Yogesh Gore's Livelihoods and Markets work with the Gordon Institute of Business Science. There was also the 2018 Inviso Festival in Port Elizabeth, which would enable easy interviews and exploratory conversations. It was definitely a test of a new tool, and there was lots of learning by trial and error. Um, there were also some concerns around privacy. Each individual reports information about others by name, so we didn't ask questions like, who do you trust? Instead, it was, how well do you know someone? And then there were a couple limitations. There was a low response rate to the survey. Um, There's also self-reported data. And I had little time for follow-up or snowball sampling, which might have improved that response rate. But no matter, it was a test. Uh, the key questions that I used to identify graduates were, what Cody graduates do you regularly communicate with? Please list up to five. And how well do you know each grad? There were more but these let me put together a basic network map. Network map. <clears throat> um, so interviews confirmed what I suspected. Uh, most graduates are probably not connected with one another. There are few, if any, opportunities to meet face-to-face -face off of the Cody campus unless they were already connected and working together or already worked for the same organization or within the same uh, network. So the email survey was sent to 360 grads from South Africa or living in South Africa since 1960. Uh, there were, sorry, the, there were a total of 367 grads, but only 250 had emails. So I sent 250 emails, 61 bounced, two failed, and I received 30 responses. So about a 16% response rate. This, the fact that grads aren't connected might help explain the low response rate. Maybe grads felt the survey was irrelevant, even though knowing that they weren't connected to each other would have been, even though me knowing that they weren't connected to each other would have been good data. In terms of survey design, not putting an option to indicate this was a mistake. It could also be out of date emails. I thought about modifying the survey and using snowball sampling, but had little time and I was also concerned about privacy, so chose not to do that. Um, you know, that's okay, it was a test and we're trying something new that we hadn't done before. So what did the visualization look like? Here was my first attempt with post-it notes. Um, actually, I first tried it out on a whiteboard, and that got really, really tricky. So I decided to go with sticky notes so I could move them around. It still left a lot to be desired. But right away, it became clear that there was not a single network, but three smaller networks, along with a scattering of respondents who knew one or two people or no other South African graduates. With, his, with this information, I decided to use a free software program called Gephi. The first step was to translate all the responses into Excel manually. With better question design, this might have been easier, um, but, it, but it really wasn't too tough. So this is what the data import table looks like. 
Let's focus on the column source three here. Three is an actor. Let's call her Betty. The second column indicates who Betty knows. So Betty knows the actor 31. And the third column indicates how well Betty knows 31. The third column is a value between 1 and 5. The weight is based on how well Betty knows each of those people. So in this case, um, 5 represents very well. 1 and 2, for example, here, they didn't know any other grads, so I left the target cell empty and the weight cell empty as well. So once this was all entered into Excel, I then imported that into Gephi. And here's my first attempt. Well, that's not great. Um, it's a bit messy, but it's getting there. With a few adjustments and testing the software, I was then able to get this map. Looking a lot better, right? So in this map, the size of the dots based on the number of connections each graduate has. In other words, the larger the dot, the more connections. The thickness of the arrow is based on how well do you know each person, the response to that. And the direction of the arrow indicates who mentioned who. Oh, Wendy has asked a question, is Gephi free? Yes, Gephi is a free software package. In this visualization, it's clear that there are three larger networks. This doesn't mean that there aren't connections between those networks or to, to some of the isolated actors, just that if there are connections, they were not identified through the survey. As I mentioned, a snowball technique was initially anticipated to help fill in those gaps. <clears throat> but social network analysis definitely needs pretty good data to do something meaningful, especially if you don't have qualitative or contextual information. I know I'm missing people who are connected to these networks, but it still gives us some information and we can you know, draw out some findings from that. So <clears throat> we, can, uh, we can clearly see the three networks, but we can't really parse each of them individually yet. So I played with the visualization a bit to spread them out and add different colors to better understand the relationships. And here's, which gave me this. Here, the thickness of the arrow and the color of the arrow illustrate the strength of the tie based on the answer, how well do you know each graduate you listed? The thicker and darker the line, the stronger the tie. The smaller and lighter, the weaker the tie. Right away, you can see that there are nine people out of 30 respondents, so 30%, who aren't connected to any other South African grads. And there are four pairs, connected mostly to someone else in their graduating class or their organization, which I determined from the qualitative information that I received. So here are the first two smaller networks. On the left is the smallest. There are two respondents and six, act six actors within the network. It's an older alumni network. Uh, the first graduated in the late 70s and the rest um, during the 1980s. The central node knows all the others very well or well. On the right is the second largest network. There were three respondents and a total of nine actors within the network. They were linked by organization and geography. The dot in the middle is actually connected to two others, but the respondent forgot to note how well she knows each of them. So in fact, it should look something like that. But I'm not sure what the strength of that relationship is. Again, fairly well connected. Everyone knows each other very well or well, except for one or two. And here's our third and final network. It's the uh, Johannesburg network. It's the largest. There were about nine respondents and 21 actors within the network. It's the largest network. ABCD's approach is central uh, to this network, though they work within different specific areas, such as youth leadership, local economic development, accountable democracies, and others. A few things stood out to me about this one. There's more light green. It's a larger network, and while there are some very close relationships, there are fewer who said they know each other very well. There are also some key connectors. The two biggest were connected to the greatest number of people. There are boundary spanners slash brokers who connect one portion of the network to another. <clears throat> and these brokers are people who can introduce people to each other and have influence over what flows or does not flow through a network. 
You know, for example, the large node in the bottom left has nine connections. They also connect into different parts of the overall network. And as I mentioned, in this visualization, the size of the dots indicates the number of connections each actor has. It helps to be highly connected, but being connected isn't the only thing that matters. Another way of visualizing the size of the dots is through betweenness centrality. This indicates how close an actor is to all other actors in the network. In other words, the shortest distance to all other actors. So let's see what that looks like. So if we do size of dots not by the number of connections, but by how quote unquote well connected across the networks, we see a couple of shifts. It turns out by number of connections, the one in red is more influential than the one in yellow. It's bigger by number of connections. But if we measure by who is most closely connected to every other point, the one in circled in yellow is more closely connected than the one circled in red. However, in my estimation, the actor in the bottom left is probably the most influential. Lots of connections and with a high betweenness centrality. So potentially well placed within the network to use those connections to link different groups. Of course, without you know knowing the context, that may not be the case. So that's why um, it is important to supplement social network analysis, particularly in an analysis like this, with contextual and qualitative information. So let's look a little bit at that. Um, so I also included some other quantitative and qualitative responses. Uh, there were three statements similar to the example on the screen. This one is around Cody graduates helped me build relationships that improve my work. The other two were around um, communication with Cody graduates has introduced new knowledge and skills, and another one on new ideas, innovations, and research. Each was followed by a text box where the respondent could explain their choice. As I said at the beginning, this is just a really initial analysis that I'm sharing with you right now. Um, so the responses across all three questions were quite similar, so I'm going to focus on those similarities across them. So for those that said that they strongly agreed that, connect, that communication with other Cody graduates has helped, they tended to be working together across multiple areas, consult each other on tools or approaches they are not as strong in, help each other meet new people, and there's often a strong personal and professional relationship. Those who stated that they agree said that others help them with the application of tools, general sharing and support, or sharing with local networks, but not more broadly. They also mentioned networking. Those who said that they neither agree nor disagree often mentioned limited opportunities to engage, haven't really been able to share about work, but do connect personally, um, you know, there didn't seem to be a sh professionally shared goals or overlap, or they simply lost touch with other graduates over the years. And those who disagreed or strongly disagreed st said that they never kept in touch or met other South African graduates. <clears throat> they noted that there aren't common platforms around which to rally, or that they are not connected to those platforms that exist. So here are some very initial observations. Because, of course, given the response rate, it's hard to say anything concrete and specific, and I haven't really been able to dive into the qualitative analysis yet. But there are a few things that I can say, especially based on interviews at the Mbizo Festival, a quick focus group with alumni at Mbizo, and some of my other activities connecting with graduates, not just in South Africa. Um, so in general, if people are connected, they are fairly strongly connected through shared goals, projects, and mutual support. Networking, sharing of new ideas, and opportunities and knowledge is often valued when there's common purpose. There are limited interactions, opportunities to interact more broadly, but relationship, relationships built by grads from the same cohort, geographical region, or area of work are often fruitful and continued. Cohorts often remain connected across borders, even over years, but are not connected to grads from other years, or often not connected to grads from other years, unless there is an existing network that they can tap into. And it's not about willingness, but awareness of other grads and these networks. There's a lot of appetite to connect. 
Um, the other thing is that the networks that exist, in South Africa at least, have been reinforced through multiple points of connection, recommending colleagues to training. Similar work in, top, in, uh, in topics or geograph geography or, um, or projects. Um, and there are often additional Cody trainings or short courses that they've been able to attend. They've also found opportunities to work face-to-face -face on concrete projects or initiatives. For South Africa, ABCD is the common thread, whether they are working in accountable democracies, resilient communities, or local economic development or youth leadership. So there have been limited opportunities to connect grads who don't know anyone else to the wider networks. Alumni from the same graduating class remain connected, often for years, and this transcends geography and transcends country. Many of the respondents mentioned that they knew many grads from, from uh, their cohorts, but didn't know any South African grads. So it's not about willingness, but awareness of the networks and other graduates. There's a lot of appetite to connect. Even webinars or online courses on specific countries, programs, or approaches can do this. The current ABCD and women's leadership online courses are doing just this and acting as that point of connection and reference. And then here are a few initial recommendations for Cody, while also noting that there are challenges. Cody cannot share contact information of graduates with other graduates without permission. Cody also has limited resources to engage systematically with graduates in country, especially for general alumni activities. You know, the activities that Cody is able to support are often tied to relationships, um, courses, and funding opportunities. So, what we can do is look to current alumni associations that have grown organically in country through face-to-face -face activities. Ethiopia, Ghana, Zambia, and Nepal are each good examples of this. And it seems like, in general, um, <clears throat> alumni networks are successful when a host organization provides a venue or there is a key leader who can coordinate or there are quarterly or bi-yearly meetups for alumni to share their work and learn together. Um, alumni association might not even be the best term, depending on the context. For the Johannesburg network, it's pretty clearly an ABCD network, and not all the actors on the map are grads. Some that were mentioned just have a strong connection to Cody through other activities, which is another limitation of this design. I only contacted people if they were in our graduate database, and those who were left out might be strong influencers or connectors. So in general, we can try to identify the active networks, bring them together, or provide general guidelines on how to form an alumni association. From the survey responses and other studies, graduates are willing to take this work on, but it will still require resources, so Cody needs to decide if it's a priority. And then there's another opportunity through Cody Connects, our graduate learning platform. Um, a potentially easy first step would be to create a space on the graduate learning platform to share opportunities and job postings. Another step would be to modify it so graduates can search each other out by country, by course, and year of graduation. So I think I'm just going to leave it at that for now and open it up for some questions. Um, these, were, these questions were largely um, for Cody graduates who are interested in graduate networks, but feel free to open it up about the uh, about the study itself or anything else that piques your interest. So Eric, Jackie has asked uh, what she needs to factor in when designing a survey. I'm wondering whether you want to address that now or do the discussion questions. You know, that's uh, it's a good question. We can talk, uh, talk a bit about it. Um, you know, it really depends on who you're contacting and what your questions are and what your what your research questions are. Um, I ended up probably asking a fair number of questions so that I could look at the different types of relationships and the different connections that people have. Um, I didn't show any of those visualizations in, uh, in, in this presentation. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I always go back to the, the keep it simple stupid or the KISS principle, especially when designing a survey so that you're not asking too much and getting not getting too much data. Um, Jackie, I'm not sure if that helps or if, if you have a specific follow-up. Uh, 
Tariq. I am designing a survey to collect uh, data about social networks of refugees. So I'm just trying to understand how that would work, particularly how they use their social networks to help them reintegrate back in their country of origin. So just to understand what kind of information I'm kind of new to social networks, so um, I just want to see how I can go about it, really. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I guess in that case, uh, since you're new to social networks and, uh, and you're still designing the research, one way to start would be by bringing together some of the, some of the potential respondents and doing the initial mapping on post-it notes and in person. Uh, just as the um, International Refugee Council did on I think the sixth slide or so. Um, and by doing that you can kind of refine what kinds of relationships there are um, presently existing, what they rely on, and get a bit of a closer look that would help you refine that, that survey. Um, the other opportunity might be to design or test the survey with a smaller group and based on that first test, refine the questions so that you know that you're getting the kinds of information that you'd like. Is that uh, helpful? That's, that's really helpful. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. And um, if, you, if you wanted to follow up offline and off of the webinar, then please do send me an email. Thank you. I will. Thanks for the question, Anthony. Um, no, I don't have a, a generic prescriptive set of lessons um, available. Um, there may be some out there, but that goes a little bit beyond what I was doing. I think the, the closest that I've come in regards to, to that through this research and through um, a couple of the other interactions I've had would be largely around building graduate networks. And, um, and there we've had some really good advice from, uh, from a series of focus groups that were conducted in February of 2017 um, from this research as well as some more recent research with our global change leaders. And this is Wendy. To add to Anthony's uh, question whether there's a generic prescriptive set of lessons learned that would be of use in building networks, um, I think I would also add the idea of trying to capitalize on what's already in existence and what is already powerful being used within those social networks themselves, like trying to add just another, another aspect of social media where it, it, there's too much noise that would be my some of my advice yeah definitely and now I'm thinking if we go back to uh, some of these other slides um, you know if you're looking to build a network um, you may wish to concentrate on the ones who are well connected um, either with lots of connections or by being connected across different, you know, smaller subsets of the network. And, uh, and those are people who can um, connect people, who can influence people, and who are often key knowledge and information brokers. Yeah, and as Wendy is noting, you know, having a shared vision, shared values, or a common uh, interest is important. Yeah. 
Interesting question, Anthony. So to what extent should one focus upon identifying and integrating key nodes slash networkers versus a big tent approach of getting in lots and lots of people? Um, you know, I don't think it's a one or the other. I think that, uh, that you want to be reaching and integrating those keynotes and networkers and what you're doing because they can then help you reach out and get in lots and lots of people. Um, and also, what's um, But then, of course, you know, that economy of scale and getting in lots of people, depending on what you're doing, is really important. But I think it depends on, on the purpose of what you're doing. You know, in, if, if we were looking at graduate networks, um, Cody graduate networks, I would probably temp be tempted to take that big tent approach uh, and get in lots and lots of people, uh, unite them around a, a common purpose, you know, make it useful to them, which is what grads have shared, and then, uh, and then let them run with it and see what happens organically. Um, certainly there will be some people who, through that approach, will turn out to be those those connectors or influencers or brokers. There's the other thing with, uh, I mean, it's true in, in social media or online, uh, some online platforms. I think it's that, you know, that if you have 100% of people who are in it, 90% read and listen and watch, 10% are using the platform frequently, and then it's something like 3% are the really active core users. Um, and so that's kind of a, a lesson from more online ones. So I suppose that indicates that taking that big tent approach can be really important. 90%, 9 and 1, Wendy is clarifying. It's also interesting, Eric, because when we look at some of the research of what's happening in social networks, um, I've been involved in a, um, a digital pedagogy uh, project over the last number of years, and we're um, we're actually you know analyzing Twitter as a source of information, and um, you know that that 99 and one has been talked about since the 70s in terms of social networking, where you know we seem to have the the 90 that you know we. we we characterize the 90 as the lurkers for some reason that's that's perceived to be negative but you know those are the th those 90 percent are the ones who just kind of have a have a um, kind of keep track of what's happening and then when something comes across their screen that they're interested in they they will move to the nine and but the key thing is to find out you know what is that shared vision what is the purpose what you know what is going to move me to the nine and that's what I'm wondering you know how your network analysis will help uh, increase that nine percentage or increase that backwards forwards flow because it's not a static thing as well I will jump into the space when it's relevant to me but then slide back and forth so how does my social network um, you know account for that So it's how do you get someone to move from the 90% to the 9%? Um, well, in this case, uh, what the graduates have shared with us is that it's really about um, finding out about new opportunities. It's about building relationships. It's about uh, potentially funding opportunities or just what's going on in their region. Um, so that would be one way of approaching it making sure that, that whatever platform is being used provides those opportunities. So uh, build it around what people want, what not what I think they want. 
and then support those people who are who are sharing that information. All right, any, any other questions at the moment? So, Guta, I'm wondering if you could ex uh, share your interest in this. May not have an active mic. <laughs> All right. Well, um, shall we leave it at that, Wendy? I think we shall. Uh, so one of the things that uh, we do with our webinars is make them available on our Cody Connects uh, playlist on our Cody International Institute's YouTube site. So if you do if you do a search in YouTube on um, on the Cody Connects, you will find all of our webinar series there. And also, I ask you to take about a minute and a half to respond to our evaluation survey. You'll notice that there is now a a hyperlink in the chat. Um, it's an anonymous survey where, that we are using to collect feedback on our webinar and for you to have an opportunity to suggest the types of webinars we can do uh, in the future and also so we can improve our own practice. So if you could do that, that would be much appreciated. But other than that, I am going to turn off the recording and uh, once our recording is up on YouTube, feel free to share the links with your friends and the people in your own social networks. And um, I just like to say thank you everyone for uh, for coming and for asking those questions. Do feel free to follow up with me directly via email um, if you would like to. Thank you very much.